Good morning, Spark Festival, or good afternoon if you're in Sydney, good evening if you're in Shanghai. We don't get much feedback here on uh, who's where and uh, what's going on, but it is an absolute pleasure to uh, connect with you all. Uh, my name is Murray Galbraith. I'm dialing in from beautiful Yugen Bear country here on the sunny Gold Coast. I would happily turn my screen around so you could see our beautiful view, but like most presenters, um, show presenting from their bedrooms these days it's um on a teetering pile of books so um who knows it'll probably fall over uh i'm gonna uh give it one more minute um before um i kick off just want to say thanks very much uh to everyone for coming along i can see some of you joining there uh is there another um computer can we grab something to just have a look at this so i can see any questions or whatever would be awesome I don't have what I thought I would have, which is totally fine. Um, all right. So thank you. How weird is this? Can I just, uh, let's just take a second, just one second. That's my wife who I get to hang out with every day and she's helping me out with this. Just, we just clean the house and did normal things and then I get to come here and talk to you guys. Like, I know it's been a horrible year, but isn't that badass? Like, isn't that really cool that like for years and years we were talking about the future and now like we're living in it. Um, cool. All right. Uh, just go to spark festival website. And have a look. Yes. That'd be wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Please. I love you. All right. So setting better boundaries. Why or why or why did I choose a topic I know almost nothing about? I'm not an accountant. I'm not a lawyer. I have screwed this up over and over and over. Um, I, I made a decision a couple of years ago to try to make every, every next step, every next project, every next uh, presentation, everything I was doing, an opportunity to learn as well as teach. So uh, this was something really important to me. It's it's driven governance as an idea, has driven a lot of uh, thinking and a lot of inquiry for me um, in post Myriad, post my last project. Um, and it was just a really interesting idea. Um, and it just so happened that Maxine, who runs Spark Festival, was also interested in that idea. I think there's a couple of people really starting to get interested in this idea of better governance and, and, and good governance. So kicking off, um, if my internet clicker works, let's see, here we go. Come on, clicker. Come on, clicker. There we go. Testing, testing. One, two. The technology is gonna work. It is amazing. There we go. Oh. What a great way to kick off. This is the question for me. Can ideas like governance, integrity, accountability be sexy? If you saw my post on LinkedIn, I don't think so, but I'm going to give it a shot. I'm going to give it my absolute best. So first, a couple of definitions. Governance is not government. I'm not here to talk about government. I have worked with government. They were great. They were also terrible like everyone, like everything. Um, but I am the, I'm certainly not the guy to stand here and talk about that. Governance doesn't equal government because government is more about politics. It's more about individuals and parties seeking power and seeking to, to govern. What is governance then? It's more about accountability. It's a system of accountability. It's about um, transparency, and uh, it's about relative outcomes, not absolute rules. So, you know, it's, it's about trying to make stuff work through empathy and um, trying to make those laws actually make sense. Um, and um, it's more about the delivery, I think. Again, I don't really understand any of that. So I thought I would just draw us a picture. So, uh, and apologies, I had a really cool version of this um, animating and it was a really nice little boat, but you know, it's not quite working. So the, the word govern comes from a Greek term meaning to steer, guide or pilot like a ship. 
And I really love this definition. It's really simple because essentially like anything, you know, the, whatever the size of your boat, whatever you're trying to do, um, you can control the boat. The more you understand the system that you're operating in, that your boat, your little, your little ship is moving in, currents, waves, wind, the better. But you can't control those, right? Like you cannot control what, um, what the system that your, your governance is going to work in, but you can try and govern that little boat. In short, the best way I could come up with to describe it is rules are meant to break. Rules are designed essentially to be on or off. Yes, no, rules break. Governance bends. Governance is about applying a level of empathy and uh, a, le a level of understanding and humility to the idea that yes, we have laws. Yes, we have rules in this place, but also we can't control the wind. <laughs> we can't control culture. We can't control, you know, all of these larger trends, which I think is much, much more important and why I wanted to focus on that um, in a post COVID world. So this is divided into two parts. First one is governance for startups. I promise you there will be some stuff here at the end, if you're not a founder, if you're not interested in startups at all, um, I, I, that's probably more the area that I'm moving into now. But hey, we're at a tech startup event, so I really wanted to make sure that we made this as relevant as possible for founders. So the alternative topic for this is why I believe this should matter more to founders than fundraising, when clearly Often, that is pretty much the only topic that most of us talk about in startups, right? So, startup, from the Latin, to steer, guide, or pilot like a boss. So, here, as you can see, I've replaced the, um, the, the little ship is the same. It knows where it's going. It's trying very, very hard to cross the ocean and change the world. But the elements are slightly different. We can control the boat as best we can. We're trying really hard. You want to get the right people in the boat. You want to get, you know, all the, all the best sailors. But the thing that's going to keep that thing moving is a combination of cash flow, wind in your sails, data, which you can break down probably into um, anywhere, any feedback, any information, right? The other currency of growth, the other part of what, what startups need. If that's feedback, if that's information, uh, it might be revenue, whatever it is. And then oh, and media, um, attention, the other stuff. And then on the outside, you've got all the, the macro trends, culture, you know, the stuff we might have a say in, but really can't control it all. It's, you know, when startups are <laughs> a, a blip on the broader, you know, cultural landscape. So, uh, again, uh, bummer. These were some really cool videos. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, I thought, as a, as a former founder myself, as a serial founder, uh, like many of you are, um, I'm not a huge fan of the little ship men, uh, metaphor. I thought, well, sometimes I've got a little ship and other times I've, I want to be building the biggest ship there is, or even a shipping cargo business or whatever the metaphor might be. So I had this really cool footage of this beautiful container ship because I just think container ships are awesome. They're really cool to look at, especially in time lapse. But the other one that um, sometimes it feels more like we're running a startup, which is a container ship tipping over its side in the middle of the ocean. And it's absolutely terrifying. And you think, why, why, oh, why didn't I have that conversation? Why didn't I organize that board? Why didn't I get those advisors? Why didn't I take their advice? All of these things that only happen, only all these considerations that are so much easier to, uh, to work through in hindsight when the boat is tipping over. Um, I, I would like to think my career is a series of shipping containers floating, falling over in the ocean. I've, I've built some cool stuff. I've built some big stuff, but I have never nailed it in the way that I think most of us would see as a huge, awesome success that goes on and sustains itself and becomes that. I don't mind. I love learning. I love lessons. And that's really why I think I would like to be able to talk to you guys about this stuff because governance 
for me is one of the things that one of the answers that comes up the most when people say to me um what what happened to this project or you know what happened there and often my answer is well i just don't think we got the governance right and so it's i've made made it my um my journey for the past you know year or two to really try and understand that and and how i can do it better next time so if the ship metaphor doesn't quite work for you, then I've found a couple of uh, founders, a couple of uh, very important founders, um, influential founders who, you know, I, I haven't used their real names. So um, I, I, I didn't want to, um, they were kind enough to tell, share me a little bit of their story, but didn't want to be um, on camera as it were. So uh, let's just say this guy, um, is, his name's Grug. He just built the world's first hammer. What should he do with it? Should he A, refine the tool and practice until he learns how to soften animal meat and maybe even build a basic structure for his entire community? Or should he B, smash his best mate's skull in and steal all his food? Both perfectly valid options. He's a caveman. What does he know? What does he care? That, yes, he's my friend, but he's got food and we all need to eat and Grug doesn't have any food. He's got a hammer, smash your mate. Or don't smash your mate, take the long way around and end up with a, with a friend and hopefully some food or wait until your friend hits you over the head, whatever it is. Everyone's got different priorities, right? Different kind of startup. This is Lucy, not a real man. Uh, Lucy just discovered radium and polonium, incredible inventor, one of the world's most brilliant founders of all time. What should she do next? World War I has just happened. It is not a good day for the world. Lucy gets to work, sells both her Nobel prizes and puts her body on the line to build the world's first mobile X-ray machines to help wounded World War I soldiers. Awesome option. Lot of work, very lonely, very, very lonely. That is a tough road to take. You don't even want the money for your Nobel Prizes. You don't want your Nobel Prizes lying around. You could just look at them. Doing that, it's awesome. Option B, patent everything, make a fortune building weapons for the government. Maybe not the atom bomb. Maybe it's too early in history to do that, but pretty sure with the right venture capital approach, I think Lucy could have done very, very well for herself. She chose to take a different route, as any of you know, but that's, that's fine. Um, third founder. Um, not as famous as Lucy, but you know, he's, he's a pretty big deal. This is Jono. So Jono just figured out how to connect 25,000 university students via his new website, this fandangled new website. Don't know what's going on there. What should he do next? A, ask his sociology and philosophy professors to help workshop potential outcomes of this new technology or B, trust the rich dude telling him to dump his co-founders and double down on data extraction. Both perfectly fine options. To a certain extent, it probably depends on where you live, what school you went to, what gender you are, all of these things that the first person you would speak to or the first people you would speak to would be either very rich, very poor, mums or dads, friends or family, whatever it is. Jono's early on in his founder journey. And I think we all know, we've all got a fair sense on which path he took. Whether or not that's true, hey, I wasn't there. But was there an opportunity for Jono to have a think about these things? Did he think about them? I don't know, maybe. But I want everyone on this call, if you're a founder, if you're building something interesting, to have a think about each of the lessons from these, each of the parts, every one of these decisions that these guys went on, where you could have said, where they could have said, do you know what, maybe I'll take a little bit longer. Maybe instead of just in, um, having a chat with my sociology and philosophy professors, I'll actually invite one of them on the board instead of the chairman of Berkshire Health, Hathaway, whatever it is, I don't know. So final one, um, this handsome fellow's name is Murray, I did not, I couldn't think of a funny name for him. Uh, so far, he's raised four and a half million dollars plus, sold 8,000 plus tickets and chartered a 747 from Silicon Valley. Those of you who don't 
Naomi from A Bar of Soap. Um, that was my last big project, a company called Myriad. Uh, we built the biggest tech and startup event in the country, um, one of them, and it was cool. Um, it wasn't as cool as Spark Festival, it wasn't as cool as South Star, um, but it was cool. You know, it was very cool. It was fun. What should he do next? A, listen to his wife and insist his co-founder makes time for the difficult conversation about roles, responsibilities, and building a board to keep them both accountable. Or option B, <laughs> let the good times roll, baby. Double down. Put it all on red 36. Red 32, I don't know. Put it all on black. Double down. Triple down. Whatever you do, you don't have the awkward conversation, mother. Don't make sure that all your hard work has been locked into a decision-making framework with a level of accountability applied by third parties. Whatever you do, don't do that. The sad truth is that Myriad doesn't exist anymore because we never prioritized that conversation. And that's a bummer for me on a daily basis because I know how close we got. I know how close so many of you are. I know how close so many founders get to being able to deliver this and execute on their incredible vision on getting that little ship or that shipping container to the other side of the ocean against all the odds against the currents of culture and the wind and the cash flow and all the crazy stuff and it's too hard to have a difficult fierce conversation with their co-founder or themselves or their family or whoever else is involved their employees around governance around how do we plan for our worst day because it happens right here. This is Miria. This is my, my co-founder and I operating at our best. There was a beautiful overlap, just like there is with so many other startup teams out there. And this can be a startup team. This can be a relationship. This can be a friendship. It doesn't matter. A beautiful overlap, but it doesn't stay like that. And we need to start planning for our worst day, for our worst time. It's really, really hard to build something hard. We all know that. It's incredibly complicated and it's exhausting and it's tiring. And it's so great when things are great. It's so great getting wins. We're all talking about mental health as an outcome. Poor mental health for founders, absolutely essential conversation. I've been suffering from that poor mental health most of my life. I'm so stoked that we're finally having that conversation. But the idea that we're not really au fait, we don't really sort of have this um, understanding, we're not, we're not building for the health of our company, of our culture, well enough by understanding ideas like governance and accountability. I think this is a really, really key part to us all doing better and these companies doing better. Because this idea is how we died and this idea is how so many other great businesses are dying. Tiny atrocities. Ling Chi, it is as badass as it sounds. The Chinese always do it. They've got such great terminology and it just it just sounds spot on. Um, Ling Chi, otherwise known as the slow process, the lingering death slow slicing or death by a thousand cuts. It was a form of torture and execution used in China from roughly 900 CE. And we are still killing our startups and ourselves and our friendships and our relationships without better communication, without drawing a line and sticking to it, without owning our, our, our power and owning that as integrity while also expecting the, the opposite, the, 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 well, the same from others. Tiny atrocities. It is a death by a thousand paper cuts. It's a horrible phrase. I just really, it, it stayed with me. Um, um, I think that's how many of us see this happening. We talk about it as like 
Oh uh, yeah, I, that was a, a, a train wreck, a slow train wreck coming up in sick. Totally great, you know, great way of describing it. When you're in it, it's a bit different. The train isn't coming down the down the tracks. It's actually, ooh, what just happened there? How did I let that happen? Oh. That was another little paper cut, tiny, tiny things. If we don't have a system in place to keep ourselves and others accountable, then how on earth can we help keep the shape of the thing we're building? So startups, why does any of this matter? What we're trying to do with every startup, every one of you, your currency is growth, right? That might be in the early days, it might be getting some emails, it might be getting some likes on Facebook. Then it might be getting intent to purchase. From there, it's purchases. From there, it's annual revenue. It's monthly revenue, whatever it is. Growth, growth, growth. What we often forget is that with growth comes data. Awesome. With data comes decisions, more decisions. Every single time we learn stuff, we've got to make another decision. Every time we need to make a decision, we're changing the shape of what we're building. And if you're building something ambitious, we need to plan for the moment when the whole world has an opinion about it and you, because they will. If you're successful, best case scenario, you make it across the ocean, despite the crazy stuff that's going on in the world, the crazy stuff that goes on always in the world, trends, culture, cash flow, all of the other challenges you're up against. If you make it, then everyone is going to have something to say about it. Everyone's going to want a piece of you. And that's what we need to design for. Because that's when you've got all of these other decisions to make. And in some ways, that's great. And in other ways, it's like, you might just go, wait, I don't want to be a part of this anymore. I want this to go on without me. I want to IPO it. I want to you know, sell it or whatever it is. How do you help maintain the shape of what you created? We need to build something and put that system in place early so that your thing can go on and exist regardless of whether you're there and still be the same sort of cool that it was, right? So my friend, Christine McDougall, who is an absolute genius, um, I was hoping I could drag her on stage um, after this presentation, but um, she's got another meeting, I think. Uh, she runs an organization called Syntropic Enterprise. I highly, highly recommend checking it out. So a lot of the terminology that I've used, I've learned a lot um, from Christine about um, governance and ideas like this, not, uh, mainly from the blockchain community, um, decentralized ledger community, um, but also, you know, particularly from Christine. And um, she's really passionate about this idea of source ideas, which we all have. That's usually the beginning of a startup, having that source idea and then putting something in place around it, which she's come to refer to as a trust manifesto. Um, some people call it a, it could take the form of a shareholders agreement. It could be laws of the land. It might be a handshake. It might just be a social contract. Hey, don't be an asshole. But that contract, that in, in nature, what we would know as a membrane needs to keep those little atoms inside. It's designed to keep them safe so that this thing that you're building can keep its shape. I honestly believe that if we'd had that, then, you know, as you can see here, not just the two of us, but anyone else or Myriad itself, that maybe that, that's what the green thing is. It doesn't matter what the other things are. I don't want to say, oh, you know, this governance is way too big an idea for me to say, that's what this is. If that applies to you, if there's two people in your business and, and the third is the company, or there's two people in your relationship and the, the green one is religion or kids, or there's... Uh, three people in your relationship and you all really want to build a company together. How can you maintain the shape of that idea without it floating off when think different things happen? When someone says, hey, I'm all about profit and someone says, cool, I'm not. I'm all about impact. I'm all about community. 
what is the governance? What is the system that you put in place early on to ensure that those things, those conversations can happen in a safe place while still ensuring the integrity of what you set out to build? So nearly done. Part two is universal governance. So that's all about startups and this is all about, I don't know, the rest of us, society as a whole. I will try not to get too, um, I'll try to get off my high horse. I know a lot of this sounds very um, lofty and hoity-toity and lame, but I also think that if we can't dig into some of this stuff, there's no point us whinging about why Trump is a president or why, you know, climate change is a problem or whatever. All of this for me is a huge part of that. So I've tried to break down part of this system um, and it's for in ways that I could understand. So hopefully it's making sense to you guys. Um, leave me a question. Um, if, if not, <laughs> hopefully my wife can pass them on at some point. Um, all right. So I'll get to questions about five, five minutes. Um, the alternative question, um, alternative title for this prelo, um, why our planet is in big trouble. So the idea of governance is inextricably linked to the concept of territory and borders, right? So if you're governing yourself, then you are only in charge of yourself. You're the, the territory and borders that you're in charge of, that you're governing like a boss is you. Startups are another example of that. They're a great manifestation of territory and borders, of a story that we tell each other, okay, cool, I'm going to build this thing and it's going to look like this and it's going to do this. I'm going to govern that thing like a boss. Unfortunately, in some ways, unfortunately, governance doesn't go beyond borders. I'm sure uh, lots and lots of governments would say that's a good thing because we don't want America telling us what we should be doing, how to govern ourselves, right? So it does make sense in some ways, but it comes with downsides. This is the UN General Assembly. It is one of the most extraordinary, it just blows my mind. It's such an incredible building. There are some people in there who are probably fast asleep, but lots of others who just think this is the coolest thing. I'm here representing the world, right? That is an awful lot of little dots within that sphere of governance. Some of them are bigger, you know, based on economic sense. Some of them are bigger based on you know, influence, whatever it is. But that is just a phenomenal system of governance that um, is at least attempting to try and work through some very big trans-border questions, that stuff that goes beyond the border, all the way down to this one, I love this. This is basically the smallest kind of governance I could think of. Within dad's car, the rules are whatever dad says. The music is, he might, he's probably even teaching his son how to drive, but it's like, I'm still, I'm in charge, I'm the boss. Within the sphere of this car, they're my bloody rules. And now that I've got a almost nine year old, and um, I can totally feel it, even though I still feel sometimes like the other guy. So this is the questions. These are the questions I wanted to leave you guys with. I know we're not, hopefully no one on the call is building a startup that is building nuclear weapons, but if you're setting out to build something which is going to put a dent in the world, here is another example of someone who is setting out to put a dent in the world. Who is going to be responsible for borders, for issues that go beyond the borders? If governance is only important and valuable up until the border of whatever we're in, whether it's a car, a boat, or a country, who is responsible for it when it gets bigger than that? Who will govern COVID-19? Is it the WHO, like these guys? Is that the best we can do? If so, why is America stopping, not, not giving them funding anymore? Will that make a difference? Do you know anyone on uh, connected to the WHO? Do you feel connected to that as an idea? Do you feel like they are effectively governing the world of health? I don't. I, I, I like the 
I like that guy. I think he does funny press conferences. Or well, sad press. I don't know. I like him. I like them all. They're doing great work. But is that is that what we need? I don't know. Who's responsible for refugees? When these people have nowhere to go in their own country, then what? That is just a mind-blowing concept to me now. Now that I'm starting to understand a tiny bit about global governance and some of the systems and structures in place to keep these people in limbo, how can they go anywhere? If you're not here and you're not there and we don't have a system that says, okay, you can go here, then it basically comes down to individual states, individual countries to say yes or no. We will, we will up our, you know, our refugee intake for today or for this year rather than we agree that it is, you know, the right thing to do for the whole system. I don't know, whatever. I, for me, that just, that image really nailed it. And, of course, the big one. Who's going to be held accountable for Earth's climate? Why, why would Scott Morrison care? It's not, my, it's not my jurisdiction, man. I'll worry about some of the stuff that's happening within my borders, sure. But some of the systemic challenges, some of the systemic causes of climate change are so much bigger than Australia. Of course you would look at it and say, well, eh, it's, it's, it's too hard, mate. That's eh, not in my backyard. We wouldn't do that. We didn't do that. We don't have to say sorry because it's a global thing. And unless we've got, you know, General Palpatine overseeing Earth, then who is accountable for these things? Who is governing the whole Earth, as it were? Because that is one complex damn system. I've barely barely scratch the surface of how many dots and how many complex systems are in place around the world. But one way that you can think about that is just, wait, we've had lots and lots of really dangerous um, pandemics and, and, and sicknesses before, but nothing has ever hit the way that COVID has because it's a unique virus, but also we are the most globalised, the most connected society we've ever been. And that thing went... And it's still smashing through our systems because we are so interconnected. In an increasingly complex and connected world, these issues are only compounding. And I'm trying really, really hard to be positive here because I genuinely believe in startups as the answer to a lot of these challenges. I really believe, and that's why I still spend my time advising and mentoring lots of people, saying, yes, it is really hard to get your little ship across the ocean. I'll help you as best I can to understand the systems, but what you're up against is only compounding. It's only increasing. Most of us in technology see this graph and go, yeah, 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 Moore's law. Yeah, I get it. I get it. Speeds, you know, 2, 4, 8, 16, 24, 64, 128. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exponential growth. No problem. But this isn't just a technology thing. This is what COVID looks like. This is what any exponential growth graph looks like. And I cannot stress this enough. This idea, this is making governance and, and, and the ideas of governance all the more complex. And this is why I spend so much time thinking about this. This is why I hope that you guys will think about this a bit more. So, um, the, the way that I, I guess I've been able to make sense of as best I can, um, make sense of exponential growth, um, is of course through a sporting metaphor, right? So imagine you're sitting up here in the beautiful MCG, top floor, top, top seat of any sporting field, right? Biggest one in the world. Uh, looking down, you realize you're actually chained to your chair for some weird reason. You are locked in. You can't go anywhere, but hey, no big deal, right? It's a beautiful day. It's nine o'clock in the morning. Maybe it's the Boxing Day test, and it is just the best. It's the best place to be. You haven't got the best seat, but, you know, it's good. All of a sudden, a single dark cloud rolls in over the stadium, but it's the weirdest thing. Just one tiny drop falls out of the cloud. 
then two. Then a minute later, four drops fall. So at 9.04 a.m., eight tiny drops fall. How much time do you think you're going to have to get out of that stadium? When will you realise that it's urgent, that this thing is doubling every minute? After six minutes, the water fills just a little tiny thimble. After 45 minutes, 7% of the stadium is filled. 45 minutes, only 7%. The hockey stick is starting to kick off from there. Exponential growth arrives then. And in the next four minutes, the whole place is full and you're drowning. If that doesn't feel familiar, if that doesn't remind us of like what has happened with COVID and how crazy, how easy it is to miss this, just look at, look at, that, look at that graph again. This bottom pink line, that is growing the whole time, but we don't notice it. We don't notice it until 45 minutes in, out of the hour. And in four minutes, it goes from being this tiny little bit to basically filling the entire study and over our heads. Okay. Um, I've got some questions. Awesome. Um, I'm basically finished. I really just wanted to say um, all of that is crazy. And then you also pile in all of the other <laughs> uh, crazy technologies. So, you know, we've got COVID, we've got, you know, all of these other exponential things, just two examples of exponential technologies that are all growing at that rate. Um, biotechnology, machine learning, you know, when they, at the convergence point, like it's hard enough for our brains to wrap our heads around um, exponential growth, but when two exponential things cross over, that's when we get all of this crazy other stuff that we can't even wrap our heads around, that we are simply not equipped to do. If we have rules for them, the rules will break. If we have some a level of governance, the governance can bend. Do no evil is a nice broad statement. Whether they stick to it or not, I, I don't know. But it would be great to have a level of governance over all of the other exponential technologies which are starting to land because I think we're at around about 44 or 45 minutes in in the stadium. These things are starting to hit now and anyone working in tech gets that. But most people don't. Most people are still sitting in, the, in their chair going, I'm chained to this chair. There's only 7% of the stadium. There's a bit of water on the ground all the way down there. But in the next four minutes, this thing doubles and doubles and doubles and the whole, we're all drowned in the stadium, right? Drowned in crazy stuff like robotics, blockchain, biotechnology, advanced manufacturing, AR, MR, whatever else, right? So maybe, just maybe, it's time we prioritised that conversation. So I implore anyone, whether you're building a tiny little sailboat and trying to get around doing awesome stuff and in, you know, in whatever way you do, just governing your little boat or whether you're trying to build the Titanic 2 or 3 or the biggest shipping company in the world. Now's a great time to think about how you can create a culture and design a level of governance within your little sphere that can hold its shape moving forward so not only you can get across the boat, get across the ocean, but hopefully um, we'll all be better off um, at the other side. Thank you so much for, for listening. Um, I hope some of that made sense and I'll go through some of these questions. Um, uh, love the simple metaphors and your experience. Oh, cool. Thanks, Joe. That's a lovely thing to say. Keen to hear the actual stories of, um, of, I don't know. Um, me too. Uh, how can you build a governance board and what should they be focused on? How do they keep the founders accountable? So this is not my um, area of expertise by any means. Um, if you are in the process of building something, I highly recommend finding a third party, a trusted third party, someone that is objective to the process, ideally isn't involved in the day-to-day -day business and who has, doesn't necessarily, like believes in your vision, sure, 
but is almost more cynical, really, like don't, is there to challenge you on, on everything. And most importantly, challenge you equally to your co-founders or to your team or to your investors or whatever. That is certainly the thing that would have made a big difference to us. Um, and, you know, we tried. It's not like we, we didn't think about it. Um, but these are very, very, these conversations are very easy to deprioritize. Um, if you're in the process, um, f- feel free to hit me up after the, uh, um, off the back of this, you can see my Twitter handle there, Murray DG, um, happy to walk anyone through specific circumstances, but, um, the, um, uh, we're all experiencing a new way to do, to do, yeah, absolutely. We are all, um, is there more? Is there more? There's quick? One down oh, cool. Okay. Sorry. I'm not getting any others. Um, No, I'm not. What's the? I'm not saying you. You can just read it to me. Uh, how do those with startup strategy, strategy, governance, operational due diligence experience, and emotional intelligence find these organisations that need directors? Oh, Jen, what an awesome question! Uh, my first port of call would be to the incredible team uh, at the Startmate um, uh, Startmate Fellowship. So if you are an operator working in an organization um, and, you know, um, full disclosure, I'm heavily involved with Startmate. I'm a huge fan of, of what they do. But the Startmate Fellowship is an organization specifically designed to help connect uh, people with all of those skills with a background in uh, tech and uh, a background in corporate and um, not necessarily uh, tech to be able to transition in as short and efficient, um, it's like a startup MBA. Um, outside of that, um, great question. Uh, hit me up. I know lots and lots and lots of startups who could really do with uh, experience from people either like yourself or with skills, with empathy and curiosity and initiative and accountability and integrity and all those things. Startups need you. So great question. Any others? How do we plan for our work? How do we plan for our worst day? <laughs> um, well, find someone who it matches you and does a much better job. Um, my wife is that for me. Um, I, uh, and uh, I think having, for me, one of the biggest things was um, having a third space, um, which isn't home and isn't work and it can be meditation for some people it can be you know a level of mindfulness um, it can be you know catching the train to work or commuting every day whatever it is but having some time where you're not in either of those spaces to be able to consider your what you're about to do or what you're doing objectively um, hopefully will give you as a first step a level of um, understanding or just appreciation for um, what you're setting out to do, what you, maybe if you're having your worst day <laughs> back at home or worst day at work and you bring it straight home, it's hard to look back and go, oh man, I should do that. Cause we've all still got stuff to do at home. You know, I'm lucky that kids are at work today, but lots of people in Melbourne and all over the world don't have that. So um, I think, to be able to have a second or a, sorry, a third space where you can look at each of those things and ideally talk to someone, give me a call. If you need someone to talk to, like planning for your worst day is about knowing yourself. That's the oldest advice, but still the best, right? Know thyself. If you know what your triggers are, if you know what you do well, if you know what you do incredibly badly, if you know what makes you fall over, in my case, I really didn't want to have a bad conversation. I didn't, I didn't want to lose a friend. I didn't want to upset someone. And I know that about myself, but I didn't plan for it. I didn't plan to have someone else who would see that and step in and say, dude, you've got to be more upfront. You've got to be way, you, you've got to be um, cleaner in your communication as it were. Uh, any other questions? 
No, cool. Um, all right, last thing from me. Um, I, I couldn't quite figure out a way to incorporate this into the um, presentation. I'll just, um, uh, oh, well, actually, I may not even be able to because who knows, maybe the clicker won't work. Oh, cool. Okay. Well, then it sounds like I'm pretty much already done. Maxine. Oh, beautiful. Thanks, Maxine. Perfect. Uh, to dive into more specifics around governance, tune into Shauna's segment at 9.55 tomorrow morning. That's Sydney time, one hour later in Brisbane, um, or the Gold Coast. And beautiful. Jen's all over it. Fee and Giselle. Oh, man, that's so good. Yes, talk to lawyers. Our accountant was like, became a really, really good friend and probably one of the few people that I felt comfortable um, asking stupid questions to um, because that's really what this is. Like if you, if you have a space where you can ask stupid questions or, you know, just be wrong, then you're hopefully not going to come up as much against my final slide. If anyone, <laughs> I, this, doesn't fit anywhere else in my presentation, but I just really wanted to be clear. Like if you don't know what the Dunning-Kruger effect is, then once you learn this, you'll realize why so much of this is so hard for founders, because we are constantly trying to learn a little bit about everything all the time. And if you don't come into this process with a level of humility and uh, a level of empathy, you can very easily walk away from every one of those new topics, whether it's 5G, blockchain, whatever, going, yeah, man, I got it. Don't worry. I got this. But the problem is that is hubris. That is, that is arrogance. That is what we now know, the Dunning-Kruger effect, because you actually need to be smart enough to know that you don't know everything. And not everyone is able to be smart enough about everything or know everything there is because the more we learn, the more it opens up more doors to stuff that we didn't know. And then we realize we're actually just very fallible. So anyway, thank you all very, very much for having me. Um, cheers, Maxine. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure and have a wonderful day, everybody. Cheers.